nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. You can follow along with this presentation by going to nanohub.org and downloading the corresponding slides. Enjoy the show. All right, so something a little bit different. So we're going to talk about measuring these transport um, parameters. So and if you grow semiconductor materials, one of the things you commonly want to do is to characterize the properties of your materials. You know, all of the discussions that we've had about theory help you interpret the measurements and find out something about the material you've grown and how good it is, you know, what its properties are, what determines its mobility, what limits its mobility, what you might do to make it better. So I'm going to just try to give you an introduction to how you do some of these measurements. And uh, so as I mentioned, you know, this is commonly used to characterize materials. You grow a semiconductor film, you want to understand what its properties are. Now, an important point is that the results can be clouded. There are lots of things that can get in the way of determining what the properties of the material are. You know, one of them is contacts. Uh, another is these thermoelectric effects might be in there in the measurement and might be, and if you're not careful to account for them, you might be misinterpreting what you're actually measuring. It's very common also to do measurements in the absence of an electric field and then turn on an electric field and do measurements of Hall effect and combine the two. So we'll talk about that also. So actually I have quite a few slides that I'm going to try to get through, but uh, it is a brief introduction and I'll point you to some standard references if you want more details. Okay, so here's the plan for the lecture and let's dive right in. So we have these uh, current equations. Remember the fundamental equation for diffusive transport, and that's all I'm going to talk about in this lecture, is current is conductivity times gradient of the electrochemical potential. I've divided by a Q so that gradient is in units of volts per centimeter. If the carrier density is uniform, the gradient of the electrochemical potential is the electric field. And I've sort of been going back and forth between those two without, without mentioning it sometimes. That, you know, if you have a material that has diffusion currents, you just replace the electric field by the gradient of the electrochemical potential and nothing else changes. Okay, and we're interested in measuring the conductivity because it should be a material dependent property. It shouldn't depend on the size of the sample or whatever, as long as we stay away from the ballistic regime. So these are our fundamental descriptions. We know the theoretical description of how we compute the conductance of a sample. We have this familiar expression now for the conductance. It's 2Q squared over H, the quantum of conductance. And there's an integral involving the number of channels at energy E, the probability that an electron will transmit across, and then this minus df dE, which we can think of as a window function. It's only peaked near certain energies and it selects out certain energies that participate in current flow. And then we do an integral over all of the energies. Okay. Now, as I said, I'm not really going to talk about ballistic transport, I'm going to stay in the diffusive regime, but if I wanted to include ballistic transport, I would just replace the actual mean free path by an apparent mean free path, and it would be the shorter of the sample length or the physical mean free path. You know, in that case, the conductivity would be sample dependent. It would depend on the length of the resistor, and it would, we're normally, when we're characterizing the property of a material, we want materials that are, we want samples that are long compared to the scattering length so we can characterize the properties of the material. Okay, if we're in that regime, we get material dependent properties. Okay, and we'll frequently, it's frequently convenient to, uh, to express these results in terms of mobility. And that happens because the conductivity is, depends on where the Fermi energy is located. And the, where the Fermi energy is located is controlled usually by the carrier density, either by doping the semiconductor and getting a certain carrier density that puts the Fermi level in the conduction band or b below the conduction band, or by having an electrostatic gate like a field effect transistor where you can move the Fermi energy up and down or the band up and down. So 
So it's very common then to measure both the conductivity and the carrier density, because from the carrier density we can deduce where the Fermi energy is, and then that'll help us interpret the conductivity. But it also means that people will frequently quote the results in terms of a mobility, because they'll frequently, instead of using our expression, they'll say sigma is n q mu, and they've measured n, and they've measured sigma, so frequently they'll just tell you what mu is, and they won't, they won't report the sigma. So we'll frequently deal with measured data that is, that is mobility. But we're going to need measurement techniques. We're going to need to measure two things. Uh, it's not enough just to measure the conductivity, because if we want to understand it, we have to relate it back to this theory, and then we have to know where the Fermi energy is. So we have to measure the carrier density both. So we want measurement techniques that will measure the resistivity or the conductivity and the carrier density separately. And then we put the two together and we try to sort out what's going on. Now let, let me just, you know, briefly mention here one thing. You know, let's, let's say, um, you know, in a 3D resistor, in my 3D resistor the conductance is proportional to the conductivity or the the conductance is proportional to the conductivity times area divided by length. Now what if I have a thin film? So in this thin film, if, if the film is not too thin, such that the electrons are not quantum confined, there are three-dimensional electrons free to move in all three directions, but I have a thin film, then I'll use my 3D expression. I'll say the conductance is conductivity times cross-sectional area divided by length. Okay, the cross-sectional area now of this thinner film, you know, it's got a different aspect ratio. The cross-sectional area is the width of that times the thickness T. Okay, so I'll write the conductivity as sigma times cross-sectional area, which is W times T divided by L. Now, if I bring the T outside, the conductivity is proportional to width divided by length, which is what we expect in a 2D resistor. And the product of those quantities is conductivity times thickness. That's the sheet conductance. The units are just ohms. Okay. So that's one way I could think about that. But I have to be careful because if I'm, if, if my film is a thin film, but the electrons are three dimensional electrons and not quantum confined, then I would use this expression. I would use my three-dimensional expression for conductance, and I would account for the thickness of that sample in the vertical direction. But if the electron, but if the layer is very thin, like an inversion layer of a MOSFET or a quantum well, then the electrons are two-dimensional electrons. They're only free to move in two dimensions. Then I would just go ahead, and when I compute the conductivity, I would use the two-dimensional number of modes. Right? That would be different than the three-dimensional. So when you're interpreting data, you would have to decide which theory do you use. Do you use a theory for three-dimensional electrons or two-dimensional electrons? And that would depend on how thin T is compared to the de Broglie wavelength of the electrons. Okay. Okay. So, in measuring mobility, the way that we would do it was we would first measure the conductivity, then we would measure the sheet carrier density, then we would deduce the mobility from this familiar expression, and then we would try to understand the mobility by re relating the nq mu to our expression for the conductivity, and then we could understand things like how are the number of channels affecting the mobility, how is the scattering effect rate affecting the mobi mobility, and things like that. Okay, so we've discussed near equilibrium transport. There are basically three transport parameters. There's a conductivity, there's a Seebeck and Peltier coefficient, but they're really the same thing. They're related by this Kelvin, Kelvin relation. And there's a thermal conductivity. And we'd like to measure all three. Now, as Professor Fisher mentioned, measuring the thermal conductivity is very difficult. People do it, but it's, it's not easy. So we frequently invoke the Weidmann-Franz law to try to deduce what it is from the measured electrical conductivity. Measuring the Seebeck coefficient is also requires some, some special capability, but people do that as well. But the conductivity and sheet carrier density are frequently done. So those are the ones that I'm going to discuss. So first one I'll discuss is how we would measure the resistivity or the conductivity.
All right, so you think it's very simple. We just take this uh, material that we're interested in determining its resistivity, we put two contacts on it, we force a current, and we measure the voltage across it. Trouble is that the contacts probably have some resistance, R sub C. So the voltage that I measure between those two contacts would be the sum of the resistance of each of the two contacts plus the resistance of the material in between, which is what I'm trying to characterize. So this creates a big problem, right? If I make a very long sample that is very highly resistive and I have reasonably good contacts, then maybe it's negligible. But it's something that we always have to worry about. This we call, would call a two-probe measurement. There are only two contacts there. Now, there are various ways that people have for dealing with this. And one is called a transmission line measurement or a transfer length measurement. And the idea here is this. If we have, this is our resistor. You can see the width and the length. We put a series of contacts along the length, but we space them by different distances. And then we just go ahead and we measure the resistance between those contacts, and we plot the measured resistance versus the spacing between the contacts. And if you do that, you'll get a straight line. And the intercept of that straight line will give you the contact resistance. And the slope of that line will be related to the sheet conductance. So you can get both the contact resistance and the sheet conductance. Actually, the x-intercept has a meeting too. It's called the transfer length. And I'll talk about what that means as well. So this is a very common technique. You can see from the date of the paper that describes it that it's been around and in use for a long time. You know, you know, people will use it all the time. Here's a side view. You know, those are the contacts on top of that resistor. And let me just blow up two of those contacts and look at what happens. So the current comes in one contact goes into the semiconductor, spreads out, flows through the semiconductor, and comes back out the other contact. So actually, this is not a completely trivial problem to analyze. Right? It's a two-dimensional flow. So let me, I'm going to get back to trying to analyze this problem. That's what that 1972 paper was all about, that was the reference on the previous slide, how you analyze those 2D flow patterns and how they affect the measured resistance. But let's do an easier problem. If I just put a metal contact on a semiconductor and the flow is vertical and it's uniform, you know, I could think about what's the contact resistance. So if I think about this as a cross-sectional view, this is a big semiconductor with some cross-sectional area coming out of the page. When I make a contact between a metal and a semiconductor, there's bound to be some interfacial layer there. So it might just be the depletion region of the Schottky barrier, or there might be a little bit of native oxide or something that's there. But there's some kind of interfacial layer there that has some kind of thickness and some kind of resistivity that it's kind of probably hard to pin down exactly. Okay. So if I want to know what the resistance of that contact is, the resistance is always resistivity times the length of the contact in the direction of current flow divided by the cross-sectional area of the resistor. So it's rho of the interfacial layer times the thickness of the interfacial layer times divided by the cross-sectional area. Okay. So you know, the thickness and resistivity of that interfacial layer are a little bit difficult to pin down independently. But resistivity is ohm centimeters, and thickness is centimeters. So people lump those together into a number that they frequently measure and quote. And it's called rho sub c, the specific contact resistant, resistivity. Its units are ohm centimeters squared. And a good number is 10 to the minus eighth. You know, uh, a reasonable number is 10 to the minus sixth. But you'll frequently see contacts that are 10 to the minus fifth, 10 to the minus third, or much higher. Now, so if I wanted to compute what the resistance of that contact is, it's just going to be the specific contact resistivity in ohm centimeters squared divide by the, divided by the area of the contact in centimeters squared. So let's say I have a contact on a small MOSFET. It might be at 
tenth of a micron in one direction, and maybe it's a wide MOSFET, so it's one micron in the other direction. And let's say I have a good contact, a specific contact resistivity of 10 to the minus seventh. So you just plug numbers in, and that's going to give you 100 ohms, which is not insignificant at all. So this is one of the big challenges if you look in the semiconductor technology roadmap. As you scale transistors shorter and shorter, the channel resistance is getting smaller and smaller. And if the contact resistance is big compared to that smaller and smaller resistance, it's really going to degrade the performance of the device. So people would really like to find ways to get the specific contact resistivity even lower than 10 to the minus eighth. But you know, that's very challenging. So that's an easy problem to do because the current flow is all vertical, easy, uniform. Now the problem that we're dealing with has a two-dimensional current flow problem. And what happens is that the current is coming along, let's say it's been injected from another contact out here on the right that I'm not really showing carefully. It's flowing uniformly through this layer that we're trying to characterize. And then it comes underneath the contact. And now it has to flow up and out the contact. So you can kind of see what's going to happen if the resistivity of that material is very high, then the current would like to flow up and get in the metal where the resistivity is low, and it will very quickly go up. But if the resistivity of the material is very low, then there's no particular reason for the current to get out into the metal where the resistivity is also low. So it'll depend on, on the ratio of those two resistivities. The length that it takes underneath that contact for all of the current to get up out of the semiconductor is called the transfer length. That was that intercept on the plot that I showed you before. And, and the transfer length, uh, if you go to that reference that I gave you from the Berger paper where you solve this two-dimensional flow problem, that transfer length is the square root of the specific contact resistivity over the sheet resistance of the material. So you be careful about dimensions here. Specific contact resistivity, that had the units of ohm centimeters squared. Sheet resistance has the units of ohms per square. Or square doesn't have any dimensions. So it's a square root of centimeters squared, so it has the dimensions of length. And you can see, if the contact resistivity is very small, then the transfer length is very small. The current can quickly get up into the metal, and it wants to do that. If the contact resistivity is very big, or if the sheet resistance is very low, then the current pre prefers to stay in the semiconductor and the contact resistance is very long. Okay. So you can see that what's happened here is that the area of the contact, really the area that matters is much smaller than the physical area of the contact, because the current is only flowing through some fraction of the area of the contact. So it's le less than the physical area. Okay, all right, so when you solve this two-dimensional current flow problem, you find that the contact resistance is given by this expression involving the hyperbolic cotangent. But if you look at that in two limits, in the limit that the length of the contact in the horizontal direction is much less than that transfer length, then it's like all of the current is flowing uniformly through the contact. In that length, in that limit, where the contact is much smaller than the transfer length, the current just flows uniformly up into the contact, and the contact resistance is the specific resistivity divided by the area of the contact. But in the other limit, where the length of the, the one that I sketched here, where the length of the contact is much longer than the transfer length, then when you compute the contact resistance, the area that you use is the width of the contact coming out of the page times the length of that, of that transfer length. So it's much smaller. Okay, so this transfer length method, you know, is very nice because we plot this, the slope gives us the sheet resistance of the material that we're trying to characterize, the intercept gives us the contact resistance independently, and the in intercept on the x-axis gives us that transfer length, so we really characterize things very well. So people will do this both to characterize the material and to characterize the contact. So that's what transfer uh, length measurements are all about. Now if you're primarily interested just in finding out what is the 
What are the properties of the material? That's what I'm interested in. Then there are simpler ways to do that. And people will commonly do something called a four probe measurement. So the idea here is that we'll force a current through a semiconductor and there will be some contact resistance when we put those probes down. If I were to measure the voltage between contacts one and four, it would include the resistance of the contacts. But if I put a high impedance voltmeter down, and those are the probes two and three, and if I measure the voltage between some section there, and if I make sure that no current flows through those probes, because it's a high impedance voltmeter, there'll be no volt drop across the contact resistance. And I'll only get the potential drop along the channel. So it's a four, a four probe measurement is a way to measure the properties of the semiconductor and get the contacts out of the picture. So people will commonly do this with something called a whole bar geometry. So we're looking down on a thin film of semiconductor. It might be an n-type layer sitting on a p-type semiconductor. That way that the current will be confined by the p-n junction to just flow in this layer that we're interested in. It might be a layer sitting on top of a SiO2 insulating film or something. It's got some thickness T coming out of the page. And we'll define a pattern like this by lithography. So contacts 0 and 5, we're going to force a current through those contacts. And we've got some redundant contacts that we don't need here, but uh, if, if I go in the direction of current flow and measure the voltage between contacts 2 and contact 1, if I do that with a high impedance voltmeter, that will give me my four probe measurement. Now, later on, we'll talk about doing Hall effect measurements. If I measure the voltage in the orthogonal direction while I'm applying a B field normal to the page, I'll be getting a Hall voltage that we discussed before the break. And that gives me some very useful information about this film. Okay, so in terms of just measuring the resistivity, the voltage between contacts one and two give me that without any contact resistance. Okay, so remember we said we have to measure resistivity and we have to measure carrier density both in order to characterize the material, and figure out what's going on. So let's talk about Hall effect measurements because it's a convenient way to measure the carrier density. Now, if we're doing gated structures like MOSFETs where there are channels, then we can frequently control the carrier density with a gate voltage. And then that's very nice. Then we know the carrier density. But if we have samples in which we can't you know, control the carrier density that way, then we can use Hall effect measurements. And you know, I'll, I'll show you how this works. So well, here's the basic idea. We, we have a B field pointing in the Z direction out of the page. We force a current in the X direction. So we're going to have some voltage drop in the X direction. That's related to the resistivity. But if I put a voltmeter across the Y direction, you know, you know, it's open circuited, so I'm measuring an open circuit voltage there, I'm going to measure a voltage. And that voltage is going to be positive for an n-type sample. And I discussed this before the break, how the Lorentz force is going to bend the electrons down so there'd be a pileup of negative charge on the bottom and positive charge on the top. That's the Hall effect. And by measuring that Hall voltage, I can learn some things about the properties of the semiconductor. So it's been known for a long time. People use it not just to characterize semiconductors, but for magnetic field sensors and other things. Okay. So the physics, I guess we, we talked about in the previous lecture, so I won't go through this again. You know, you can just think about the electrons moving at some average drift velocity. Think about the Lorentz force minus QV cross B. They get deflected, charge piles up. You build up an electric field in the y direction, and therefore you have a voltage across the y direction. Okay. Now, if we want to do a quantitative analysis of, this, analysis of this, we can take the current equation that we derived. And remember, this, this current equation, it was the first term is what we had with, in the absence of a magnetic field, sigma times the electric field. So I'm not writing gradient of electrochemical potential because I'm assuming that I have a uniform density of carriers here. And the sigma is nq mu. Okay. Now, 
The second, the term that involves the uh, cross product of the electric field and the magnetic field has a sigma in it, but it also has a mu in it, but it also has this annoying numerical factor, this Hall factor, this average of tau squared divided by the average tau quantity squared, which is some numerical factor that, pen, that depends on details of the energy dependent scattering in the band structure which people commonly hope is between one and two, but there's no guarantee. Okay. And people actually sometimes try to pin it down, but it takes a lot of work. Okay. So, you know, we can do an analysis of it like this. We can, uh, we can take our current equation and we can look at the x component of the current, and we'll just evaluate the x component. That's the first line there. The magnetic field has a small effect, so the x-directed current is just sigma times electric field in the x-direction. Now, I can also evaluate the y-directed current, but the experimental condition is that I'm open-circuited in the y-direction, so no current can flow in the y-direction. So I set jy equals zero, and I just take the electric field in the y-direction, and I take the cross product in the y-direction, and I get the second line. Okay. So now I can solve for that y-directed field, because that's going to give me the Hall voltage, and I can see it's proportional to the x-directed field and to the b-field. And the x-directed field is proportional to the injected current from the first line. So when I get all done, I'm going to see that the ratio of the y-directed field to the current density in the x-direction and the magnetic field that I've applied in the z-direction is something that I'm going to measure, right? So that's my, now you have to get terminology straight. That's the Hall coefficient. The little r is the Hall factor. The Hall coefficient is what you would measure. So you would go in the lab and you would force an electric uh, a current in the x direction so you know j sub x. You would apply a magnetic field in the z direction so you know b sub z. And you would measure the Hall voltage and from the Hall voltage, you can deduce what the, what the, uh, what the uh, electric field in the y direction is. And the ratio of those quantities is capital R sub H, the, the measured quantity. And the theory says that that measured quantity is this Hall factor, little r sub H, this numerical factor of scattering times, divided by 1 over Q times the carrier density. Okay. And the Hall factor, or the Hall coefficient, has different signs for N and P type, so you can, because the Lorentz force is in different directions for N and P type, so we can tell the sign of the semiconductor. Okay, so the idea in doing the analysis then is uh, if I take this Hall factor, if I multiply the top and the bottom by the width of that sample, then I get the Hall voltage on top and the current density in 2D is current per unit width, so I get the actual current on the bottom. So, um, so what I actually measure is the Hall voltage, and I divide it by the injected current in the applied magnetic field. The theory says that that quantity is Hall factor over Q N sub S. Remember that the Hall factor is this ratio of scattering times. Now. If I define this quantity, I'm going to define something now I call the Hall concentration. Because what I can deduce now, you can see from that middle expression, there, capital R sub H. I've measured R sub H. I know what its numerical value is. If I knew what little r sub H was, I could solve that equation for the carrier density, which is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to determine the carrier density. Now the thing is, I don't know that little r h precisely, and it's very hard to know it precisely. So we'll define this quantity, which is the carrier density divided by that factor, and we call that the Hall concentration. So when people do Hall effect measurements, they will frequently say, I've measured the carrier concentration. What they mean is, I've measured the Hall concentration. I know the carrier concentration within a factor of maybe one or two, you know. If I have some unusual scattering mechanisms or band structure, it might be even worse than that. But what you actually measure is the Hall concentration. Okay, so we go back. You know, I asked my colleague over here in the Burke Center, you know, give me some data. So 
They make hall bars like this with dimensions where the length is typically 100 micrometers, uh, the width is about 50 micrometers. It's nice and easy to do without any fancy lithography. They'll typically inject a current of about a microamp. They'll, a common magnet can easily give you two kilogauss. That's a small magnetic field. Uh, Gauss is not an MKS unit. Remember that 10,000 Gauss is one Tesla. That's an MKS unit. So this is 0.2 Tesla. That's the value I would put in the, the expressions to get the, the right units. And if you go in the lab, first thing you would do is turn the magnetic field off. Actually, to first order, the magnetic field doesn't affect this voltage. And you just measure the voltage between contacts one and two. All right, let's say it's four tenths of a millivolt. And then you turn the magnetic field on and apply it normal to the page. And you'd measure a voltage between contacts two and four. That would be the Hall voltage. Let's say that's 13 microvolts. Okay. So then we should be able to deduce three things. The resistivity, the sheet carrier density, and the mobility. At least those are the three things we would like to deduce. All right. Okay. So uh, we go back in. Let's do the resistivity. The resistivity is kind of easy because people will say that this voltage that I measured in the direction of current flow, they'll call RXX. It's the voltage in the drop in the x direction when I've injected a current in the x direction. And that's just that V sub 2, 1 divided by the injected current. That's 400 ohms in this case. And we know that that's resistivity times length divided by width. And we know the dimensions of the Hall bar. So we have a material that is 200 ohms per square. That's, that's what we were trying to measure. OK. OK, let's see if we can get the sheet carrier density. So for the sheet carrier density, we look at the Hall. Um, we look at the measured Hall voltage. And the theory says that the actual sheet carrier density divided by this unknown Hall factor, this thing we're calling the Hall concentration, is just the known current that I injected, the known B field that I applied, divided by Q times the, the voltage that I measured in the Hall voltage. Plug numbers in there, and we get a Hall concentration of 9.6 times 10 to the 12th per square centimeter. And we hope that that's close to the real carrier density. But we're always a little bit uneasy, because we're not quite sure. OK. Uh, now mobility. Uh, how do I get mobility? So you think that, well, I have resistivity, and I have carrier density. Resistivity is 1 over nq mu, so I should be able to get mobility. But we don't quite have the carrier density. We only have the Hall carrier density. So if I look at conductivity, which is 1 over 200 ohms per square, and I set that equal to nq mu, well, I can divide by the Hall factor, because the quantity that I know is the actual carrier density divided by the Hall factor. And then I can multiply by the Hall factor again. And then I can plug in the, the Hall concentration that we just deduced. I can take the sheet conductance, 1 over 200 ohms per square that we just measured. And I can solve. But all I'm going to be able to solve for is R sub h times mu sub n. So the only thing I can solve for is the product of the actual mobility and the Hall factor. So we call that the Hall mobility. So that's what comes out. And we kind of hope that it's close to the drift mobility that, that we've been dealing with before. But we're, we're never really sure. But it's the best that we can do. So these are widely used. You know, Every lab that does semiconductor work will have a, have a little magnet that can give you a few kilogauss. And they'll be set up to do these kind of measurements. And, you know, the terminology to keep straight is what you measure is what's called the Hall coefficient, the capital R sub H. There is this statistical factor, which depends on details of band structure and scattering, which is little r sub H. And the two things that you get out of these measurements are the Hall concentration and the Hall mobility. OK. Yes? For the little r sub H, do you have an idea of how much it would uh, vary in a given material, you know, across different conditions like doping or things like that. Yeah, so you so, take it as being pretty constant. Certain material. Yeah, so you can. You know, so the question is, you know, do we have any typical numbers for R sub H? And actually, I, you know, I should know these because 
Um, I think, you know, you know, if you put in like ionized impurity scattering in a simple semiconductor with parabolic bands, I think that number is 1.93. And if you put in acoustic phonon scattering in a parabolic band, I think it's, it's close to one, I think. So this, this is why people say, well, it's generally between one and two. So if your material is heavily doped and you think you're dominated by ionized impurity scattering, you might guess that it's closer to two. Okay. But if it's slightly doped and you're dominated by phonon scattering, you might guess that it's close to one. But, you know, I, I've seen papers where people have tried to figure out, like, well, what is this for the valence band that has a very complex structure? And I've, I've seen numbers, I think, of four or more. So it, you know. Sometimes you can estimate it and feel confident that you've got a good estimate, and, but there are cases where it, you could be quite far off. Right, and the other thing I was saying was how much you think it changes around some center point. Because right? usually you're looking at things like mobility versus doping or something. Yeah. Right. So as long as if you don't think it changes. Well, so that's why, you know, the common answer is it varies between one and two. Right. So when you're doped lightly, it's closer to one. And when you're doped heavily, it's closer to two. All right. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, I want to talk about another way of doing these measurements, just because you'll hear about it frequently. And it's commonly used. And it's, it's really a, a neat idea and a very old idea. So it's called the van der Poel technique. It is just, it is another way to do resistivity and Hall effect measurements on a different geometry. If you don't want to take the time to, uh, to do lithography and make one of these Hall bars, if you just want to like break off a little chunk of your sample and maybe put, put four little, uh, solder dots around the edges, you can do Hall effect and resistivity measurements on that. And the, the amazing thing is, even though you don't know precisely what the shape of the sample is, you can still get the right answer if the contacts, if you satisfy a, a few conditions. Like, so this is a 2D film. It doesn't have any precise shape, but it has to be homogeneous, so its properties aren't varying spatially. It can't have any holes inside it. Okay? And the contacts have to be small, and they have to be on the perimeter. If you can do that, then you can do this measurement. And the way the measurement works is something like this. You just pick two of those contacts, and you squirt a current in one and out the other. So here I'm forcing a current in contact M, and it's coming out contact N. So there will be some 2D flow of current through this sample. Now, if I measure the voltage between the other two contacts, there will be some potential difference between those two contacts due to that 2D flow of current. You know, that 2D flow of current will set up a potential variation in there. I'll call that voltage V sub P O, because you know, P is where I measure the po my positive side and O is the negative side. And then I'll divide that measured voltage by the current that I injected, so that gives me something with the units of ohms. And I'll call that R sub M N comma O P. It's the resistance when I've injected the current in contact M and take it out of contact N, and when I measure the voltage between contacts O and P. Somehow that ought to be related to the resistivity of the sample. And you would think that it's probably related in some kind of complicated way, but it's not so complicated. Now, you can also do Hall effect measurements on these samples, and they work this way. You now you inject the current in one contact and you take it out in another, but you, you don't do it in adjacent contacts, you skip one. And then you measure the voltage across the other two contacts. So in this case, I would label the resistance, the, I take the voltage I measure, divide by the current we've injected, we call that a resistance, and I would call that resistance uh, R sub M O, Current comes in contact M, goes out contact O, comma NP. I'm measuring the voltage between contacts N and P. Now that, it turns out, is related to the Hall voltage. So we can get both of the things that we want from this sample. Okay. So let me just quickly go through this. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of the details, but it's not, it's not too difficult to do. Um, so let me just give you a flavor for how it works. So if I'm doing the Hall effect, 
we're just going to take our current equation that we developed yesterday. And the current is going to flow in the xy plane. So I, my top two equations then are just expressions for the current in the x direction and in the y direction. I'm interested in what is that measured voltage drop between contacts N and P. So that's going to depend on the electric field inside the sample. So I can solve those two equations for the electric field in the x and the y directions. And then I can take an integral from contact N to contact P of the electric field along a path that goes between those two contacts. And it will just be, the voltage will just be minus the integral of EX DX plus EY DY. Okay. And I could evaluate what that voltage is. Okay. That would be, if I've applied an electric field pointing out of the page, I would call that V sub P N V sub Z. That, that's what I would measure. Now, if I also measure, if I reverse the direction of the magnetic field and measure that voltage, and if I subtract the two quantities and take one half of them, that's going to turn out to be the Hall voltage that I'm after. Okay, so, um, so if you do that algebra, what you'll find is that, you know, I'm simply going to take those expressions for the electric field, insert them into that integral, uh, subtract the two quantities with opposite sign of, of a magnetic field. The expression that we'll get for that voltage is that. Now if you look at this, what is the integral of jx dy minus integral of jy dx? Well, it turns out that that is the integral of j dot ndl. So if I think of a dotted line going between n and p, that's an integral of the normal component of the current along that line. So all of the current that goes in has to go across that imaginary line that I'm integrating from n to p to to get the voltage and come out the other contact. So that integral is just the total current that I injected in. So when you get all done, you know, what you would measure in that is resistivity times Hall mobility times the B field that you've applied times the current. That's what we got from the Hall bar geometry. And you would get that from this same geometry, and I, you don't even have to be careful about where you place these contacts or what the shape of it is. So that's very nice. So we can do Hall effect measurements on these samples without doing lithography and etching and making Hall bars. Okay. Now, how do you do resistivity? So let me give you an idea of how this works, too. So doing resistivity on that sample is actually kind of a complicated problem. It's not as easy as the Hall effect problem was. I'm going to get some 2D flow of, of uh, current through that pattern. I'm going to set up some 2D potential drop, and I want to know what the potential drop is between contacts P and O. Well, here's a sample that's much, here's a problem that's much easier to solve, an infinite half plane. Let's do the infinite half plane with four contacts along the boundary, because it turns out the answer is the same. So I'll have my four contacts again. They'll be spaced by distances A, B, and C. And I'll label them M, N, O, and P. And I'll do, I'll inject the current in contact M. I'll take it out in contact N. And I'll measure a voltage between the other two. Okay. All right. And I'll call that R sub M, N, O, P, just like before. So if you look at this, if I inject a current in contact M, this is a small point contact. It's just going to spread out radially in this half plane. So the current density would be the current per unit length in 2D. It would just be the total current I put in divided by the circumference of that half circle. Right? And the current density is conductivity times the radial electric field. So that would give me the, the radial electric field that's coming out. And now if I want to compute the potential drop anywhere in this sample, I would just integrate minus E dot dr, and I could get the potential drop between any two points. So if I integrate 1 over r, I get a logarithm r. I have to pick some location in the sample as a reference. I always need a reference point for the voltage. 
So I'll pick some arbitrary location R0, and that will be my reference location. And I'll just integrate minus integral of E dot dr, and we'll get that expression for the potential drop. OK, so what do we do with that? If I go over and I look at contact P, contact P is located uh, a distance from contact M of A plus B plus C. So that's, I put A plus B plus C in the numerator. How about contact O? That's located at a distance A plus B away. And I have this arbitrary reference location somewhere. If I subtract this two, that arbitrary location drops away because I'm just asking for the voltage difference between those two points. So my voltage difference is related to the current that is injected, the resistivity, and then the logarithm of the spacing of these contacts. Right, so the spacing of the contacts is important. Now I also have to remember that I have a current that I'm pulling out from contact N. What, what does that do? Well, in this infinite half plane, I can just superimpose the results. I have a contact going in, one contact. That gives me a potential drop that we just computed. We're pulling a contact with current out from contact N. That gives me an electric field in the opposite direction. So I just get a different sign. And now the distance between contact N and contact P is just B plus C. And the distance between contact N and contact O is just B. So I get an expression for that. All right. OK, so this resistance that I measure is just, uh, I think there's a minus sign there. It's the voltage difference between those two contacts divided by the current. And the result is going to be that expression A plus B times B plus C divided by B times A plus B plus C. OK. OK. Now, I can also do, I could also do a similar one. I could also inject the current in contact N, take the current out contact O, measure the voltage between contact P and contact M, and go through the same analysis. And I would get the expression here. Okay. Now, it's actually quite simple. If you multiply each of those by pi over R sub S, and then exponentiate each of those, and then add them up, you'll see that they add up to 1. Okay. So that means that if I can solve that equation, the two measured quantities are R sub M N O P and R sub N O comma P M. Those I measure. Okay. Then if I put it into that equation, and if I guess the sheet resistance, and it ends up solving that equation, I've got the right sheet resistance. So I can just, I could solve that equation. I think you have to solve that equation iteratively. I don't think there's an analytical solution to it. So that's very nice. Now, I don't know how van der Poth thought this up, thought to do all of this, but it's beautiful. Now, he took it one step further. He said, OK, if we could do that on an infinite half plane, he knew some complex analysis, and he knew how to do conformal transforms, and he knew that he could map that infinite half plane onto any arbitrary shape as long as there weren't any holes inside or anything. So the same equation holds for an arbitrarily shaped sample. So again, all I do is inject the current in two contacts, measure the voltage at the other two contacts, divide by the injected current. That's one of those measured resistances. Then I inject the current in the other two contacts, do the same measurement. They have to satisfy that equation. And if I solve that equation for rho sub s, I get the result. Okay. So this was done in like the 1950s. As I said, I don't, because it was very hard to do lithography and make hull bars. If you could just break off a little chunk of sample, it worked very nicely. But it also works very nice. P people frequently now will do this with lithography. You know, they'll, instead of making a hull bar, they'll just make a little square sample and put four small contacts around the edges. The same equation applies, except in this case, because of symmetry, those two resistances are equal. And now you can easily solve the equation, and the sheet resistance is just pi over log 2 times v over i. I think it's 4.631. About 40 years ago, I used to do these measurements. And I always, I always would inject 
I think 4.631 milliamps when I did this because then the answer would come out in ohms, right? Anyway, something like that. Okay, so that's the van der Poel technique. So just to summarize so you know about this because, you know, there are two common ways to do these techniques. They both, in the end, give you the same answers. Either you make a hall bar geometry and you do it, or you make a van der Poel geometry, you get the same information. Um, uh, when we're doing the Hall effect measurement, we'll inject current in alternate contacts, apply an electric field out of the page, measure the voltage in the other two alternate contacts. We'll flip the sign of the magnetic field, measure the same voltage again, subtract the two, and uh, multiply by one half. That gives us the Hall voltage. When we're doing the resistivity, we inject current in two adjacent contacts. We measure the voltage in the other two adjacent. Divide by the injected current, that gives us a resistance. Do it for two, the other two contacts, and then solve this equation, and we get the resistivity. Okay. Okay, so that's the van der Poel method. So we have two different ways. You know, different labs like to use different approaches, but, you know, both of them are commonly used. So we can get the sheet resistance, the carrier density, and the mobility if we want. So, you know, let, let me talk a little bit about uh, temperature-dependent measurements. So a lot of times, the, the measurements, the equipment that people have set up to do these measurements will frequently have a temperature-controlled stage so that you can do all of these measurements as a function of temperature. Because if you do it as a function of temperature, you might be able to do, to do something about what's going on in your material. So if you ex extract the mobility and uh, plot it versus temperature, people will produce plots like this. Now, they won't always be careful. What this probably is is the Hall mobility because it was probably measured by the Hall effect. So you have to read the paper and find out exactly how did they deduce the mobility. Um, not always. In a MOSFET, you don't have to use Hall effect in order to do this. But you'll frequently get a characteristic that looks like this. At low temperatures, as you start heating things up, the mobility will improve. But if you go to high temperatures, it'll turn around and start to drop. And there's a simple interpretation of that. You know, the decreasing mobility at high temperatures suggests that there's more and more phonons or lattice vibrations that are scattering. And the increased mobility at high temperature or at low temperatures suggests the presence of charged impurity scattering. So experimentalists will do these measurements. They'll see a characteristic like this. They'll say, aha, I'm dominated by charged impurity scattering at low temperatures, and I'm dominated by phonons at high temperatures. And why does charge impurity scattering have that? Remember we talked about how the, the, the randomly located charges put a roughness on the conduction band edge which scatters electrons. If the electrons have higher energy, they don't see that roughness as much and they scatter less. And their kinetic energy is then going, related to KT. So as you heat it up, they have more kinetic energy they're higher energy, they don't see the, the uh, roughness of that conduction band edge as much, and they scatter less frequently, so the mobility increases. The phonon scattering is also easy to understand. We expect the phonon scattering rate to be proportional to the number of phonons that are there. The number of phonons is given by this Bose-Einstein factor, and there's a temperature in the denominator, so you can see that as the temperature increases, the number of phonons is going to increase and they're going to scatter more electrons. Okay. So let's say you have a series of samples, you know, you, that you've grown by different techniques and you, you might uh, get some characteristics that look like this. Um, and generally what will happen is that the, the purer samples are the ones that are plotted over to the right. So what happens here at high temperatures is they all look alike because they're all dominated by phonon scattering. But the samples that are doped less heavily or that have fewer unintentional dopants in them um, will display different characteristics. So as you cool a sample and you get less and less phonon scattering, you'll reach a point where now the ionized impurity scattering is dominant. And that has a different temperature characteristic, so you'll turn around and go down. 
if you're more pure and there are fewer dopants, then you have to cool it more till you get to the point where the charged impurity scattering becomes important, and then you'll turn around and go down. So the maximum mobility that you can achieve is related to how pure your sample is. So a lot of times when people are growing crystals and they're trying to understand how pure it is, you know, how many unintentional dopants or charge defects do I have in it, they'll do a measurement like this and from the peak doping, from the peak mobility, they can tell something about what the concentration of either intentional or unintentional dopants is there. Okay. So a couple of other things. Uh, I'm on borrowed time here now, so I'm going to do a couple of other things here quickly just because I think you should be acquainted with them. One of the things I wanted to talk about are possible errors in Hall effect measurements. You know, good experimentalists are just enormously careful about things when they do these measurements and look for anything that can happen. You know, so, you know, if you look at this, we're injecting a current in contact zero and taking it out contact five. Okay. You know, and I was thinking I'm doing this measurement at some temperature, 300K, or maybe I cooled it down to 77K or something to look at how things change with temperature. Okay, but we understand thermoelectric effects. And we know that if we inject the current in contact zero and take it out in contact five, we should have Peltier cooling on one end and Peltier heating on the other end. Now, maybe we put this thing on a good thermal conductor and we're trying to hold its temperature constant, but we, we might not be able to hold it perfectly constant. There may be a temperature gradient in the X direction. You know, how would that temperature gradient in the X direction affect what we've measured? Okay. People who are careful experimentalists worry about that. Okay. So I just briefly, you know, let me, this is going to go by a little bit quickly, but let, let me just give you a flavor for what happens. We have this magnetoconductivity tensor. So I can write that expression on the top as a sum, you know, my rule for matrix multiplication is sigma sub ij times e sub j, and I sum over j, x, y, z, one, two, three. Okay, that's what's going to give me the ith component. Okay. Now, what people will frequently do is they, they won't show you this, this sum, and they'll make this rule that when they say sigma sub ij times e sub j, whenever an index is repeated, you're supposed to do the sum. That's called the summation convention. So that expre that's just another way of writing the equation on the top. We'll call that indicial notation because it shows the indices, and the other one is in vector matrix notation. Now, I can write our current equation in indicial notation also. And, but then I have to learn how to write a cross product. And the trick for writing a cross product is introducing this thing called an alternating unit tensor, epsilon sub i, j, k. And it has the property that if the indices are in the proper order, x, y, z, or it doesn't matter, it could be y, z, x, as long as it's increasing in that order, it'll be plus one. If they're in the opposite order, like z, y, x, it'll be negative one. And if any index is repeated, it'll be zero. And if you follow those rules and figure out which components come out of that expression on the lower right, you'll see that that's e cross b, what we had in our expression before. Okay. So what that means is that we can take our expressions for our transport equations, we saw that all of those parameters, resistivity, Seebeck coefficient, Peltier coefficient, thermal conductivity, become two by two tensors. We can write them in this additional notation. And then I can, exp if I apply a B field, we acquire these off diagonal components that came from the cross product from the Lorentz force. They're all going to look similar to the conductivity. And they'll all have expressions like that. So they'll all look like that. Okay, so now let's get back to the problem that I'm trying to solve. Let's assume that we're doing this Hall effect measurement, but we've got an inadvertent temperature gradient in the x direction. And the question is, how is it affecting our measurement? Okay, so in the Hall effect measurement, so we'll start with our current equation. In the Hall effect measurement, 
we're trying to deduce what the electric field is in the y direction in the Hall bar. So we'll just ex write this expression for the uh, electric field in the y direction. We'll just expand that out. Okay. Now, if I look at that expression, uh, first of all, my experimental condition is that I'm open circuited in the, in the y direction, so j sub y is zero. If I look at the second part, I'm applying an electric, a magnetic field in the z direction. I'm only allowing current to flow in the x direction. So the only possibility, let's, let's see, uh, j, uh, j sub j is j sub x. Um, okay, right, so epsilon sub y j z becomes epsilon sub y x z. Those indices are in the wrong order. So that's a minus one, because they're going in anti-cyclic order. Uh, I have a Seebeck coefficient that also depends on that cross product. And that depends on the temperature gradient in the x direction and the magnetic field in the z direction. And that's a y, x, z. That's also in the wrong direction. Okay. So this is what I get. This is my expression. There will be a contribution due to the Hall voltage. That's what we measured before when we did the Hall analysis. But there's an extra part of the voltage now due to that temperature gradient in the x direction. That temperature gradient in the x direction has ended up giving me a contribution to the voltage in the y direction. Okay. That's called the Nernst voltage. All right. We want to deduce the Hall voltage, and from the Hall voltage we can get the Hall concentration. But we might, there might be a little bit of Nernst voltage. You can see that the Hall voltage is proportional to the magnetic field times the current. The Nernst voltage is proportional to the magnetic field times the temperature gradient. What if I quickly switch the magnetic field and the current at the same time? Well, the Hall voltage won't change sign. But the Nernst voltage will change sign, and the temperature gradient is going to take some time to change and reverse. So frequently you'll see in Hall effect measurements, they're all set up to do a measurement and then quickly switch the current and the voltage and do another measurement again and then average the two because you can cancel out various extraneous effects that way. Okay, so there's a bunch of these effects. Now, there's another one called the reggae leduc effect. They, they all have to do with these various thermoelectric effects in the presence of a magnetic field. The annoying part is there's one called the Eddingshausen effect that has the same dependence as the Hall voltage, and it can't be subtracted out with this switching. But at least it should know that it's there. OK, so I want to end by just saying a little bit about small magnetic fields and what happens at hard, uh, large magnetic fields, just because I think you ought to be acquainted with, even though we can't do justice to it, you ought to be acquainted with it a little bit. Early on in the, in the lecture before the break, I made an assumption that we were dealing with small magnetic fields. And remember, there was this cyclotron radius, uh, cyclotron uh, frequency, which was the frequency at which the electron orbits the applied magnetic field. It's just QB divided by M. And I said I could throw away all of those extra terms if I said that frequency times the scattering time is much less than one. Now, you can also see that I could write omega C tau as uh, Q times tau over M times B, so I could also write it as mobility times B. So another way of expressing the low field criteria is mu times b is much, much less than 1. So first question is, what is the physical meaning of a small magnetic field? So we have this b field pointing out of the page. We have electrons that are orbiting the b field at the frequency omega sub c. But every now and then they scatter, and, and it deflects them. And the low, what the low field criterion means is that it scatters many times. It scatters frequently before it can complete an orbit. In the high frequency regime, the frequency would, of orbit would be much shorter than the scattering time, so you could actually complete an orbit. Okay. That's the difference between low and high magnetic fields. Okay. So let's look at some numbers. If you do silicon, 
And if we take a typical laboratory magnet, it's a few thousand kilogauss, and if we compute numbers, then omega c tau or mu times b is much less than one. We're in the low field regime. So for the common magnets that are inexpensive and easy to find and that people include in their labs, for a material like silicon, it would be very hard to get to the high field regime. Okay. Okay, you know, just to calibrate you, you know, the kind of magnets we have over here in the, in the Burke Nanotechnology Center you can, are somewhere between one and eight Tesla. You know, one Tesla is 10,000 Gauss. All right. So we're frequently in the low field regime. If you want to get really high magnetic fields, you go to somewhere like the National Magnet Lab where you have a superconducting magnet and you might be able to get up to 45 Tesla and then you could get to high magnetic fields. Now, but there are materials that have very high mobilities or low scattering rates where you can get to high magnetic fields with common laboratory magnets. And these tend to be three fives. So if I look at a material like a modulation doped indium aluminum arsenide in gas structure, at room temperature, it mo its uh, mobility might be roughly 10,000. And now, now this product is approaching one, you know? If I had a magnetic field that was uh, one Tesla or a little more, I, I might be able to get there at room temperature. If I cool it down and go to liquid nitrogen temperature, I can get greater than one. So with these high mobility materials and common laboratory magnets, you can get into the high field regime that we've avoided so far. What happens in the high field magnetic regime? So some really interesting things happen here. and. Uh, so we have this electron orbiting, and now it can complete an orbit because we're in the high magnetic field. So it's like a harmonic oscillator. But we know that from quantum mechanics that harmonic oscillators are, have quantized energy levels. And this is a classic problem you solve in quantum mechanics, and you find that the energy levels are quantized n plus one half times h bar omega. The one half is the zero point energy, and then you can have quanta of energy above that. So this motion, these energy levels have to be quantized. These are called Landau levels. So what does that do? So we have this 2D film. The density of states was constant. It was the same at any energy. But now when we put the high magnetic field on, we can only have quantized energies. There can only be discrete energies where the electrons are. That means that these, this continuous density of states has been broken up into a number of Landau levels. So they're all separated by omega c. The density of states is now a series of delta functions just located at these different energies. Now you might ask, what's the strength of the delta function? How many states are there in each delta function? So we haven't created any new states. We've just rearranged them. All of the states now have to fit into these Landau levels. And if I look, you know, the Landau levels are separated by h bar omega sub c. My 2D density of states was m over pi h bar squared. That's the number of states per EV. So in that white region there, there are h bar omega c times the 2D density of states, states in that region. All of those states have collapsed into that one Landau level. So the number of states in that Landau level is 2q over b divided by h. So they're just all divided up there. Now, you know that, let, let's ask what happens if you do scattering. You know, what happens if there is a little bit of scattering? It makes an orbit or two and, it, and then it scatters. Well, those levels are going to broaden. And that should be expected because we have this uncertainty relation. Delta E, delta T is greater than or equal to H bar. So if there's some uncertainty in the amount of time that it's in a Landau level, the Landau level is going to broaden in the energy. So the uncertainty is the scattering time. So the width of those levels is going to be on the order of H bar over tau. So if we want to observe these Landau levels, then the separation of the Landau levels has to be bigger than their broadening, otherwise they'll all merge together and we won't see any individual ones. Well, actually, the criteria that the separation of Landau levels is bigger than the broadening of, of an individual Landau level 
is omega C tau is much, much bigger than one. It's just the, the criteria that we've been using for high magnetic fields. So if we have a high enough magnetic fields, these Landau levels are separate. And, you know, you can see some numbers here. Let's say we have one Tesla. We can compute the density of states in each Landau level. We can do, say, a modulation doped film. Let's say it has 5 times 10 to the 11th uh, per square centimeter of electrons. Then you just divide that number by the density of states of each Landau level. And you can see that 10 of these are completely filled, and the last one is 40% filled. Okay. Now, how high a mobility would you need to observe these? Well, let's see. You need mu b greater than 1. So basically, for a 1 Tesla field, you need mobility greater than about 10,000. But we can do that in these high mobility materials. You know, they're, typically they're done by techniques called modulation doping. So these are the kind of things that you might measure. And, you know, just to, I'm not going to go in detail through this, but, but, uh, but we'll discuss some of it. There's a um, very nice reference I have at the end. Okay, so we, we sweep the magnetic field along the bottom. So you can see it's going from zero Tesla up to eight Tesla. Okay, that's a reasonable regime, you know, right? We have, those are the magnets we have in our lab. You don't have to go to a superconducting magnet in order to get those kind of fields. On the vertical axis, uh, to the left, we're measuring the Hall voltage. Remember that the Hall voltage was proportional to the magnetic field. And you can see down near the origin, that line going up at about 45 degrees, that's just the measured Hall voltage proportional to the magnetic field. That's the way it's supposed to work under low magnetic fields. That's what we derive. Now, the axis on the right is the measured voltage in the x direction and the direction of transport. That's what gives us the resistivity. Now, under low magnetic fields, those were the diagonal elements of the magnetoconductivity tensor. The magnetic field didn't affect them. We just measured the resistivity. If we had a low magnetic field, nothing changed there you can see that that line is constant and independent of magnetic field to begin with for small magnetic fields. Then it starts to oscillate in these beautiful oscillations. That's happening when these Landau levels are developing. And as the Landau level, as, as you increase the magnetic field, you increase the separation between these Landau levels. Okay. Sometimes you have a finite number filled, sometimes your, your Fermi level goes inside a Landau level, and then it goes between a Landau level. You know? So you just get this oscillation. From the frequency of that oscillation, you can determine the carrier density. And this is a common technique that people use in these samples to get the carrier density instead of the Hall effect. Now, you see some even more interesting things going on if you, crank the, if you continue to crank the magnetic field up. You can see that the voltage drop in the direction of current transport starts to go down to zero. There is no resistance. There's no voltage drop there. You can see that the Hall voltage starts to acquire steps. Every time the resistance in the longitudinal direction goes to zero, the Hall voltage reaches a plateau. And you can see the numbers there, 12, 10, 8, 6, 5, those are the number of Landau levels that are occupied. As you get the small, uh, stronger and stronger electric uh, magnetic fields, they're separated more and more, and fewer and fewer of them are occupied. Okay. So what is this? Right. 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 So this is the quantum Hall effect, you know. And to explain this is is a is a little more involved. It, it involves things like edge states. You have a, electrons tend to move in one direction along one edge of the bar, and the, the ones moving in the opposite direction move along the opposite edge of the bar, which makes it very difficult to backscatter, because the only way it can backscatter is to go to the other edge. You know, so, you know, it wasn't too long ago where a Nobel Prize was awarded for the discovery of this effect, but it's something that is very commonly observed now. People will routinely do it in the lab to measure the Hall effect. Uh, when people started working on graphene, one of the first things they did was to look at the quantum Hall effect, and it displays unusual features that come from the band structure of graphene.
Okay, uh, these oscillations that you see before the onset of the quantum Hall effect, when the resistance drops to zero, these periodic oscillations in magnetic field are called Shubnikov, the Haas oscillations. It's a commonly used characterization technique in the lab, to, and from it you can deduce the number of electrons that are there. Okay, so just to summarize, you can use either Hall bar or Van der, Paul par, blah, 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 Van der Paul geometries to measure resistivity and Hall effect. The temperature dependent measurements are typically done too to give you more information about scattering mechanisms. Careful experimentalists really worry a lot about extraneous effects that can be getting in the way of what you're trying to measure. So those thermoelectric effects are an example of them. And for the most part, I've discussed low magnetic fields, but high magnetic fields are accessible when you're dealing with high mobility materials, and some really interesting things happen there. I haven't talked at all about how you measure Seebeck coefficients or electronic <coughs> heat conductivity. Uh, those are a little more difficult to measure. Okay, so uh, let me just point you, uh, reference one here is a very comprehensive, if you need to work on characterization and you want a very comprehensive book that, that covers most of the commonly used techniques, that's a very good reference. Uh, you can look at this, the, the standard reference for the Van der Poel technique is still this 1958 paper by Van der Poel. And, you know, I mean, he solved it correctly and people still use it. Okay, so that's it. Um, we're almost at lunchtime, but if, you're, uh, if you have any questions, we can take a few questions before lunch. Yes, sir. When we are doing all measurement, suppose we have a setup with a maximum magnetic field, uh, some electromagnet. Now, if we want to make measurements on a sample which has very uh, low amount of doping, say 10 is plus 16 or 10 is plus 14, now one issue would be to make homemade contacts. Uh, but in all this discussion, we are assuming that we have an homemade contact. Yeah. So, is well, yeah, I don't. So, your, your question is are we assuming that we have ohmic contacts here? Now, so if, if I'm doing a Hall bar geometry, I may have some bad contacts for the current injecting ones, but I'm not measuring a voltage across those contacts, so it doesn't really matter whether they're bad, right? And, you know, I might have some bad contacts when I put my two probes down to measure the in the four probe measurement, but no current is flowing through those contacts. But so, making a resistance measurement, what we will do is we will do a voltage sweep and measure the current, uh, or make a current sweep and do a voltage measurement, and then from the slope we will determine the resistance. If it's a short, uh, if it's a shorty, we won't be able to do that, right? Yeah, I mean, if it's a nonlinear voltage characteristic, yeah. Yeah, but but in the Hall bar geometry, even if that's nonlinear, you're forcing a current through that bar, and then you're just measuring a voltage along at two points inside the bar. So I I don't think the contacts are really hurting you in that kind of measurement. Yeah. And, uh, and if if suppose we have substantial doping and we have made an ohmic, so what we usually ohmic is that. Uh, the carriers are now going through by tunneling because the depletion region is very thin there. Mm -hmm. So then would we observe these uh, thermoelectric effects? Because it's not now going above in the conduction band, but just going through it. Right. So your question is, if you dope the semiconductor heavily mm -hmm. in order to try to make a good contact, uh, would you see these strong thermoelectric effects? So I think the answer would be, you know, a heavily doped semiconductor has a low Seebeck coefficient, or means it also has a low Peltier coefficient. So no, they, they would be less important for heavily doped semiconductors. Yeah, I think there's a question near the back. So the incomplete method of the contact is which is uh, discussed at the beginning. Hmm. Uh, does it take into account the type of the contact or uh, transmission?
are you you're asking about this this transfer length method? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's it's this method here. And and your question is, does it? So does it depend on the type of the contact you have, or is it general for any? Well, you know, so here you know we probably are assuming that we have ohmic contacts here. Yeah, and. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't really tell me anything about the details of the contact. It just tells me what the contact resistance is, right? But, but the contact does have to be an ohmic one, right? Can't, it can't be a rectifying Schottky barrier, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the philosophy is, you know, a lot of times the contact resistance is something really important that you want to know. So then you use a technique like this that will tell you not just the sheet resistance of the material, but also the contact resistance. If you're mostly interested in the material and you're not so interested in the contacts, then you use these four probe measurements or hull bars, and uh, that, that just allows you to measure the material you're interested in. Yeah. Okay.